Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I think that the title of this lecture series is Ambidexterity. So what I would like to do at the end on Saturday, I guess, is tell you about a recent theorem proved by Mike Hopkins and myself. But what I'd like to do for most of the week is just sort of build up to that. And today I'm going to start by describing what was uh, some of the motivation for the theorem. And that really fits into the theme of this conference, which I think is, is uh, topological field theories or something like that. So uh, let me start. Andre started in his lecture telling you what a conformal field theory is. Um, that's, let me tell you instead what a, according to Atiyah, a topological quantum field theory is. That's an easier version of what Andre was talking about earlier today. So this definition is due to Atiyah. An n-dimensional topological quantum field theory is a tensor functor or a symmetric monoidal functor from the category of n minus 1 manifolds and bordisms between them to the category of, let's say, complex vector spaces and linear maps. So when I say manifold in this talk, I'm going to mean a uh, smooth, compact, oriented manifold. If I don't mention it, I probably mean that it doesn't have boundary, but I also want to think about manifolds with boundary. Uh, so when I say n minus 1 manifold, I'm thinking that it doesn't have boundary. And the collection of all n minus 1 manifolds can be organized into a category where the morphisms are bordisms. So here's a picture of a morphism in the case n is equal to 2. Here's a bordism from a pair of pants. Uh, that's a surface whose boundary is three circles. And I've drawn it on the board as something that I want to interpret as a bordism from one circle to two circles. OK, so uh, let's j just unwrap this definition a little bit to get used to it. What does this mean? Well, this means that if you have a manifold m of dimension n minus 1, then you're supposed to produce a complex vector space. And if over here you have some m min n minus 1 manifold m, another n minus 1 manifold n, and you have a bordism b from m to n, you're supposed to get a linear map. This is supposed to be a linear map from the vector space z of m to z of n. This should be compatible with composition in the sense that if you have one bordism which is glued from another pair of bordisms, then the linear map that it determines is just given by composing the linear maps corresponding to the pieces. And finally, that's what it means for z to be a functor. Finally, it should be a tensor functor, where as in Andre's talk, the tensor product over here is given by disjoint unions. Whereas the tensor product over here is the usual tensor product of complex vector spaces. So that's saying, for example, that if you have a disjoint union of two manifolds m and n, then z of the disjoint union should be the tensor product of z of m with z of n. And also a degenerate case of that, if you took a disjoint union of an empty collection of manifolds, well, z of the empty set as Andre explained, should be the complex numbers. So this is Atiyah's definition of a topological quantum field theory. And I expect that it's familiar to a lot of you. But just to get us all on the same page, let me start by analyzing this in the case n is equal to 2. That's roughly the case that Andre was talking about today. 
So what do you need to do to specify such a functor when n is equal to 2? Well, first you have to say what it does on objects. So the objects in this category on the left are closed n minus 1 manifolds, or closed 1 manifolds. So we know what all of those look like. They're just disjoint unions of circles. And we also know that z is supposed to be a tensor functor. So if you know what it does on one circle, you know what it does on all closed 1 manifolds. So let's say you have a two-dimensional topological quantum field theory. Then you can evaluate z on the circle, and you get some vector space, which I'm going to call A. But that vector space is not all there is to the story, because th while that tells you what this functor is supposed to do on all objects, there, you also have to think about what it does on morphisms. So this vector space A is equipped with some additional structures. So for example, um, if you evaluate z on a pair of pants, now I want to think about that pair of pants as having two ingoing circles and one outgoing circle. Well, this gives you a linear map from z of two circles to z of one circle. And z of two circles is just a tensor a, while z of one circle is just a. So let me call this map m for multiplication. This is giving you some kind of multiplication on the vector space a. And that multiplication is not arbitrary. It, it actually makes a into a commutative and associative ring. So for example, what does commutativity correspond to? Well, something I probably should have mentioned earlier but didn't is that uh, these bordisms here are considered up to diffeomorphism. So if you have a diffeomorphism between two bordisms, they're the same morphism in this category. And therefore, z assigns to them the same linear map. So in this case, there's a diffeomorphism of the pair of pants with itself that exchanges the two legs of the pair of pants. And the existence of such a diffeomorphism tells you something. It tells you that this multiplication m has to be commutative. So m is commutative. And as an exercise to get used to this idea, you can prove also that m is associative. And to prove that, you'll want to think about the following picture. Here's a bordism from th three circles to one circle. And there are multiple ways you could cut it up, multiple ways you could write it as a composition of two individual bordisms. For example, you could cut along the dotted line. So m is a commutative and associative multiplication. And there's also a unit for the multiplication on m. Where does that come from? Well, let's consider a disk. So a disk, I'm going to think of this disk as drawn here. It's a bordism from the empty set to a circle. So you could apply z of the disk to the disk. And you'll get a linear map from z of the empty set to z of the circle. And I said z of the empty set is the complex numbers, and z of the circle is a. So that's a map from c to a, or in other words, an element of a. And it's not hard to convince yourself that that element is not an identity with respect to this multiplication. So this is, why don't I call it 1? There's a little bit more structure here. Because every time you have a bordism between two manifolds from m to n, you could just switch everything around and read that bordism as read that same manifold as a bordism from n to m. Well, you have to change the orientations, but let's not worry about that. So what happens if you do that to the disk? Well, you can read the disk as a bordism from a circle to the empty set. And that gives you a map from A to the complex numbers. So let me call that TR for trace. 
And if you play around with the axiomatics here a little bit, here's another thing you can verify. This is a slightly harder exercise. Um, the trace pairing. Um, a goes to A. If you take A tensor A, which goes to, you can multiply to get into A, and then you can take traces to get to the complex numbers. This trace pairing is non-degenerate. In other words, it gives you, it induces an isomorphism of A with its own dual. So if you like this composite map, this is also a linear map that's associated to a uh, two manifold with boundary, namely just take an take a cylinder, but regard it as a bordism from two circles to the empty set. So the axiomatics imply that this gives you a non-degenerate pairing on A. In particular, it implies that A has to be finite dimensional. So this is a very different kind of uh, thing that we're considering than Andre was considering, where the values were typically infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So let me summarize our discussion. Summary, every two-dimensional topological quantum field theory determines, well, what is sometimes called a commutative Frobenius algebra. So if you, if you don't know this terminology, this is just the terminology to describe exactly what we saw over here. A commutative Frobenius algebra means a commutative algebra, commutative and associative, together with a trace map from that algebra to C, which gives you a non-degenerate pairing. So every two-dimensional topological quantum field theory gives you one of these, and a folk theorem is the converse. Namely, any commutative Frobenius algebra, from this commutative Frobenius algebra, you can recover the topological quantum field theory. The data of a two-dimensional topological quantum field theory and the data of a commutative Frobenius algebra are equivalent. So what is this saying? Well, you, knowing the Frobenius algebra tells you what your functor is supposed to do on all one manifolds, because remember, to a circle, you're assigning A. And to a disjoint union of circles, you're just assigning a tensor product of several copies of A. Of course, you also have to say what you want to do on arbitrary bordisms. Say you had some complicated, say you had some more complicated surface here with, with lots of holes. Here's something that's a bordism from two circles to one circle. What should Z do to this? Well, you could figure this out. And the way that you figure it out is by cutting this picture up into pieces where each piece looks like either a pair of pants or, or a disk. So let me draw some, some dotted lines that will cut this picture up into pairs of pants. So if you cut along the dotted lines, if my picture is readable to you, then you will have cut this surface up into what looks to me like five pairs of pants. And Z is a functor, so once you know what Z does on each of these pairs of pants, by composing all those linear maps, you'll know what Z is supposed to do on the entire surface. So uh, that's the sort of recipe that you would follow if you wanted to, if you started with your commutative Frobenius algebra and wanted to recover the topological quantum field theory, wanted to recover the functor Z. And the content to this folk theorem is that this procedure uh, that you follow will give you a well-defined answer. In other words, the linear map that you get will not depend on exactly how you drew these dotted arcs. Yeah? Uh, what do you do with the backwards pair, backwards pair of pants? Ah, right. I'm so what happens to a backwards pair of pants? Well, first, what happens to this shape, we've already said. 
this shape gives you an, uh, a map from A tensor A to the complex numbers, which is the trace pairing, and that's non-degenerate. So it identifies A with its own dual. And now, if you take a pair of pants, so that gives you this multiplication, A tensor A to A, this has a dual map. If you just take the induced map of dual spaces, that's a map from A dual to A dual tensor A dual. And A dual by the trace is isomorphic to A via the trace pairing. So we could think about this dual map as a map from A to A tensor A. And if you play around with the axiomatics, you will be able to convince yourself that that is the map that is associated to a pair of pants pointed in the other direction. So, uh, so I gave you this definition of a topological quantum field theory, which is emphasizing what such a thing does on manifolds of dimension n minus 1. But there's another way of thinking about a topological quantum field theory, emphasizing what it does on closed manifolds of dimension n. If you have a closed manifold of dimension n, you can think about it as a manifold with boundary, where the boundary happens to be empty. So you can think about it as a bordism from the empty n minus 1 manifold to itself. So if you evaluate z on a closed n-manifold, that gives you a linear map from the complex numbers to the complex numbers. And of course, all linear ma such linear maps are just given by multiplication by a number. So you can think about the values of z on closed n-manifolds as giving you numbers. From this point of view, first and foremost, a topological quantum field theory is a manifold invariant. It's something which to every manifold of dimension n gives you a number which is diffeomorphism invariant. And while it's more data than that, you also have values on n minus 1 manifolds and rules for what happens to n manifolds with boundary. And you can think about that as a toolkit, which helps you to compute the values of z on a closed n manifold. You have some numerical invariants, and you have some rules that tell you how to compute them. So let's see how this would go in dimension 2. If, what are the numbers? that you would associate to, uh, to your favorite closed zero manifolds. I'm oh, sorry, closed two manifolds. Well, the first thing you might do is evaluate z on a two-sphere. Why don't I draw that equator like this, emphasizing that what you're supposed to do, the way you compute this is by cutting along this vertical equator. So this is a number, but this number can be obtained by composing z of this disk with z of the other disk. So this is a map that starts in the complex numbers, goes to A. Remember, this disk gives you the identity element of A. And then you go back to the complex numbers by taking the trace. So if you have a commutative Frobenius algebra, here's what it does on the two-sphere. It assigns a number, which is the trace of 1. Let me just do one more example for a later reference. What happens if you evaluate z on a two-dimensional torus? Well, you can compute this in the same way. Let's cut a two-dimensional torus into two cylinders by cutting it along these little circles that I've drawn here. So this would be the composition of z evaluated on this cylinder with z evaluated on this cylinder. So you should think of this as a, this is a map from C going to A tensor A going back to C. So this thing here is the trace pairing. 
And this map here is just the dual of the trace pairing. So if you want to think about what map you're getting here, it would be convenient to not call both of these vector spaces here A. Let's think of one of them as A and one of them as A dual. A is isomorphic to its dual, but it'll be maybe easier to think about it this way. So now what are these maps in these terms? So A tensor A dual, you could think about that as endomorphisms of A. So this map from A tensor A dual into C is just the usual pairing. If you have a, an element of A and an element in the dual space, you evaluate and you get a number. So if you think about this tensor product as endomorphisms of A, this is taking, you take an endomorphism and you take its trace. And now what is this map? Well, that's just the dual construction. If you think about what endomorphism that gives you, you get an element of end A which corresponds to the identity. And when you compose these two maps, you just get a number which is the trace of the identity map. Now trace not in terms of the trace on A, but the usual trace on uh, matrices. So what is this number? Well, it's the dimension of A as a vector space. So. Uh, If you would like to do another exercise, you can try and figure out what a genus 2 surface will give you. Although it, it's not going to be something that you can write as simply as these two examples. All right, so I wanted to give you the definition of a topological quantum field theory because first of all, it's, it's a big theme for this week. And uh, second of all, because what I want to talk about or the origin of the thing that I'm going to be talking about later this week is trying to find some examples of topological quantum field theories. So what I'd like to do with the rest of this lecture is tell you about a particular construction of this sort of data. And it's a construction that I'm going to try to generalize later on. Jacob? Yes? Um, I kind of want to compare this to Andre's talk. So in his case, he gave um, the ob his objects were one uh, were zero dimensional manifolds. Um, but if you up that so that his objects were uh, one dimensional manifolds, could you kind of I, I mean, you have the same pictures in that category, too. So you can also define like this trace pairing also in that context. So well, so, just... so first, uh, Andre was talking about, he started talking about uh, conformal field theory in, in Siegel's sense, which was not extended, where you only had one manifolds and two manifolds. And then he, the rest of his talk was about extending that. So you had something defined on points also. You can throw in the extended to this discussion as well. It's not something I'm going to talk about. Um, but then in his setup, you can consider a, uh, a cylinder like that. And to each of these circles, you would associate a Hilbert space. And this would give you some kind of structure. But his was a conformal rather than a topological field theory. So actually, you should indicate more than just the, the shape of this diagram. This should acquire a conformal structure. It's an annulus, and its conformal structure is maybe something uh, something that you would describe. There's, there's not a unique conformal structure that you can give to this. And the map that you get in his setting will depend on the conformal structure that you choose. And in particular, it won't, it's not forced to be a perfect pairing because, for example, you know, cylinders that look like this are not forced to give you the identity map. And you can't get perfect pairings in that setting because the Hilbert spaces that you produce are not uh, finite dimensional. And what about in the topological setting? In the topological setting, the axioms force all of these vector spaces to be finite dimensional automatically. So this is, this is a toy version of the kind of thing that Andre was talking about. OK, so the rest of this lecture, I want to talk about an example of a topological quantum field theory. So. That's called Dijkraaf-Witten theory. So it it comes in. I'm sorry. Are you sure? Yeah. Because you're going to have the non-degenerate. Sorry, I'm ruining the exercise. Yeah. In this exercise, what you're drawing is you're drawing the identity, and then you have this S shape, and that that, that gives you the proof that this thing is non-degenerate. Mm -hmm. Those two things aren't equal in the category I'm describing. They're only equal up to a cobordism. 
a higher cohort. So, so you're not getting a non-degeneracy this condition shape on the nose. You're getting a non-degeneracy condition up to diffeomorphic. These are diffeomorphic to each other. Right. But I'm saying in the thing I was explaining, I'm saying you have your objects are one manifold, uh, your morphisms are cohortisms. Maybe I need pointed manifolds. Corn manifolds with corners. And then you have cohortisms between those cohortisms and that, that's No, no, you have diffeomor so it's a it's an ordinary category. Your objects are one manifolds. Your morphisms are diffeomorphism classes of bordisms. So these two bordisms are diffeomorphic to one another. Well, my and question is about the, the one more tier version. Well, OK, that would be a three-dimensional quad. Right. And I, I'm not talking about that. OK. But you're, I mean, do you know anything about that case? And um, what? I mean, so maybe. I have this picture yeah. that you drew. But in my category, these two things are not the same. Well, these, these are diffeomorphic even if you allow three-dimensional cobordisms. They'll give you the same map. OK, that answers my question. So I want to now talk about an example of a topological quantum field theory called dijkraff witten theory. So let me first do the untwisted version of this. And later, I'm going to add a twist. So the input is a finite group G. And now if you have a finite group G and you have a topological space X, then you can talk about G bundles on X. <coughs> so let me remind you, what is a G bundle on X? A G bundle on X is a covering map. x tilde mapping to x, where with an action of g by deck transformations. So that when you take x tilde mod the action of g, you recover x. Or this is, maybe I should say a free action. So I'm going to think about G bundles on topological spaces. And let me hopefully remind you that these G bundles are classified. There's a classifying space for this sort of data. Namely, G bundles on X up to isomorphism are given. To give a G bundle on X up to isomorphism is the same thing as giving a map from X to the classifying space for G up to homotopy. So here, the classifying space for G written BG, this is a space with the following property that if you look at its homotopy groups, what these look like are G if i is equal to 1 and they're trivial otherwise. So there is a space with only one homotopy group. And its fundamental group is G. And moreover, that space is uniquely determined up to homotopy equivalence, at least if we're working in a reasonable, if we're talking about CW complexes or something like that. So such a space is called the classifying space of G. And giving a map from X to the classifying space of G is the same thing as giving a G bundle on X. So now, what I'm going to be interested in is counting G bundles. So let me tell you what dijkraff witten theory does. So you can do this in any dimension. So let's fix a dimension n. And I'm going to define for you an n-dimensional topological quantum field theory. Let me first um, tell you what it does manifolds of dimension n. So remember, to such a thing, what we want to assign is a number. And what that number is going to be is roughly the number of G bundles on m. So let's say, let me assume for simplicity that m is connected. And let me just first write concretely what number you assign here. So. What you, the number that you assign is the number of homomorphisms 
from the fundamental group of m into g divided by the order of g. So that's a rational number. And that's what this field theory assigns to m. So uh, this, is th this numerator is finite. Because m is a compact manifold. So its fundamental group is finitely generated. And if you want to know what a homomorphism does, you just have to say what it does on each generator. There's only finitely many choices. So there's a finite number of homomorphisms. Divide that by the order of g. That's the number. So this is the concrete way of describing it. But maybe I should give you a, a better way of thinking about this number that uh, doesn't re require m to be connected. More generally, what you should think about this number as, this is the number of g-bundles on m counted with mass. So let me explain what counted with mass means. So what we're trying to understand is the collection of all g-bundles on m. So if you want to study a g-bundle on m, well, one of the things you'll learn, and first things you'll learn in a course on topology when you study the fundamental group, is that the data, if you fix a base point uh, on x, and you also fix a base point on x tilde, then the, the data that's described here, giving this data is equivalent to giving a map from the fundamental group of m into g. Now, if you don't fix a base point on x tilde, well, different choices of base point give you different homomorphisms from pi 1 of x into g. And those different homomorphisms differ by conjugation by the elements of g. So another way of maybe I should give you write that out. So if you look at have any space x and you look at g bundles on x up to isomorphism, well, if x is connected, this can be described also as group homomorphisms. from the fundamental group of m into g up to conjugacy. So roughly speaking, the number of g, well, exactly speaking, the number of g isomorphism classes of g bundles on x is the number of conjugacy classes of homomorphisms. Now, I want to count these not up to isomorphism, but with mass. So what that means is I'm not just going to consider g bundles up to isomorphism, but I'm going to remember the isomorphisms. So let me write that as follows. You do this as follows. So the number of g bundles on x, let's say, counted with mass, what this means is you take a sum over all g bundles x tilde over x of 1 over the automorphism group of x tilde. So what is that automorphism group in these terms? Well, the automorphism group of a g bundle is just, if a g bundle is given by a homomorphism from pi 1 of m into g, its automorphism group are just, is just given by the subgroup of g consisting of elements which centralize the image of that homomorphism. So you could also write this as the sum over all homomorphisms alpha. Well, I, maybe I should say conjugacy classes of homomorphisms alpha from pi 1 of m into g of 1 over the size of the centralizer of alpha. Now. I could also write that as a sum over all group homomorphisms from pi 1 of m into g of 1 over the centralizer of alpha times 1 over the number of homomorphisms which are conjugate to it. But of course, the centralizer of the size of the centralizer times the number of conjugates, that's just going to be equal to the order of the group. So you recover this formula up here. 
this is the number of homomorphisms alpha from pi 1 of m into g divided by the order of g. So that expression up there is in some sense counting how many g bundles there are on m. And that's what dyckraff witten theory is, is about at the top level. It's about counting g bundles. So these are numbers. Let me now tell you how to make this into a full two-dimensional topological, or I said n-dimensional. Let me tell you how to make this into an n-dimensional topological quantum field theory. So let me tell you what you're going to assign to a manifold of dimension n minus 1. So here, you're supposed to assign a complex vector space. And I'll describe it to you. This is the set of locally constant functions on the space of maps from m into bg. So let me talk a little bit about this space. So if m is a manifold, I can look at maps from m into bg. That, that I can make into a topological space. And because of this statement up here, the connected components of this topological space are in one-to-one -one correspondence with isomorphism classes of G bundles on X. So you should think about this roughly. This is, some, this is a space of G bundles on M. So what does it look like? It has one connected component for each G bundle. And each of those connected components is reasonably simple looking. What does it look like? Well, it's, an, it's again a space of the form BG, but maybe not for the same G. So this space is homotopy equivalent to a disjoint union of isom over isomorphism classes of G bundles, x tilde mapping to x of the classifying space of the automorphism group of x tilde. So that automorphism group is always just a subgroup of G. So x is m here? What's that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, m tilde to m. So now, I probably said this in a, in a uh, unnecessarily complicated way. What I want to do now is look at locally constant functions on this space, which means functions that are constant on each connected component. So to describe such a function, I just assign a number to every G bundle. So this is a complex vector space. And it has a dimension equal to the number of G bundles on M up to isomorphism. And now this is not counted with mass. This is just uh, the dimension of this vector space is the number of isomorphism classes of G bundles on M. So what you're doing on manifolds of dimension n minus 1, you're again, in some sense, counting g bundles. But now you're recording the number of g bundles not by a number. You're recording it by a complex vector space. So now let me tell you how this categorical invariant is related to the numerical invariant that I defined a little earlier. So let me tell you how z becomes a functor. So now let's suppose that we have a bordism between two manifolds of dimension n minus 1. So m and n are manifolds of dimension n minus 1. b is a manifold with boundary whose dimension is equal to n. So then I want to consider. I can look at G bundles on B, and any G bundle on B restricts to give me a G bundle on M and also a G bundle on M. So now, what are we supposed to do? So what does the definition tell us we're looking for? Well, to this data, we're supposed to have a procedure which takes a locally constant function on this space and makes a locally constant function on this space. 
So let me tell you how you do that. So the first thing you do with this function is pull it back. So if you have a function to every G bundle on M it assigns a number, then in particular you get a function which to every G bundle on B assigns a number. It just ignores what your G bundle looks like outside of M. So let's say if you have a function, the first thing that you do is pull it back or restrict it to get a function up here. And now you want to make a function down here. And roughly the idea is that you're supposed to integrate. So what does integrate mean? So you have a locally constant function up here. So to every G bundle on B, we assign a number. And now, suppose we have a G bundle on N. We want to assign a number to that. So what we want to do is think about all different ways we can extend that G bundle on N to make a G bundle on B. Take the corresponding numbers and add them all up. Well, we should be a little bit careful. So what do we mean by add them all up? So if you look at, if you take a point here and look at its inverse image, it's, it's a big space. It's not a finite set. But it's not that complicated a space. If you look at the inverse image of a point here, it's the kind of, it's a space with the same kind of structure as each of these three spaces individually. It has finitely many connected components, and each of those connected components is the classifying space of a finite group. And when you have such a space, then you have the idea that you can count things with mass. Namely, you just take a sum over all connected components of, well, you can look at the value that your function takes on those connected components, and then you should divide by the size of the fundamental group. That's the right way to count things in this context. It's so I don't know if I should be more explicit about that. Would people like to hear more about that or less about that? More, more about that. All right. So, so let's give these two, these two maps names. So let's call them phi and psi. So now let's suppose that f is a locally constant function from maps from m into bg to the complex numbers. So it's something that assigns a number to every g bundle on m. Why don't I not call this f? Why don't I call it, um, why don't I call it a? So a lives in z of m. So now z of b on this element little a, this is going to be an element of z of n. And what that means is it's going to assign to every g bundle on n a number. So I have to tell you what number to assign. Now to a g bundle n tilde over n. Or why don't I actually not call that a g bundle, but let me call this a point x. So let's suppose x is a point in that space there. So what number do you assign? Well, you take a sum over connected components of psi inverse of x. So psi inverse of x is a subset of this space. It's a subset with finitely many connected components. And now each of those connected components maps to a connected component here. And therefore, my original function a is constant on that connected component. So let me call the connected component c. So what do you do? Well, you, roughly speaking, you take phi of c, and then you apply a. So phi of c. That's not really a, an individual point of maps from M into BG. It's, well, it's some subset of maps from M into BG, but it's contained in a single connected component. So A takes the same values on all the points of phi of C. So that's what I mean by A of phi of C. So this would be uh, 
this is some kind of integration. This is adding up the values of A on all the connected components, but we're supposed to count with mass, which means that each connected component counts with a multiplicity. If it's the classifying space of a group G, it counts with the uh, multiplicity 1 over the order of G. So we should divide this by the size of pi 1 of C. Does that make sense? So this might sound complicated, but note that it's just a generalization of the first thing that I said. So let's do an example where m and n are empty. So then z of m and z of n, these are both just the complex numbers, maps from m into bg, maps from n into bg, both of those spaces are just a single point. So, so we have maps from b into bg. So, for, so let's say b is a closed manifold of dimension n now. So it's a bordism from the empty set to the empty set. And now we're thinking about this diagram. And so what is our procedure? So we start with a number thought of as a function on the one point space. And then we pull it back to here. So that just makes a constant function with value equal to the number we chose. And now we integrate over this space to get, a no, to get a function on this space. So the procedure says, well, you add, you take a sum over the connected components of this space of 1 over the fundamental group of the component and times whatever your number was. So that produces, that's a construction which gives you a map from C to C. And that map is just multiplication by what earlier we called z of bn. It's multiplication by the number of g bundles on b counted with mass. So this is a definition. Now I want to convince you that, that it might be interesting. So this is kind of hard because this is not the best example of a topological quantum field theory. It's a really, I'm even doing a toy version of dyckraft witten theory right now, and dyckraft witten theory is a toy example of a topological quantum field theory, which is in turn really a toy version of, uh, of say, the kind of thing Andre was talking about earlier today. So this is really, really a toy example, but nevertheless, maybe there are a few interesting things we can say. So let me specialize to the case where n is equal to 2. So we analyzed this earlier. We said giving a topological quantum field theory in dimension 2 is the same thing as giving a commutative Frobenius algebra. So let's figure out what that is. So we're supposed to take z of s1. And what is this? So z of s1 is the set of c-valued functions, or locally constant, c-valued functions on maps from S1 into BG. Or in other words, um, functions on the collection of isomorphism classes of G bundles on the circle. So how do you describe a G bundle on the circle? Well, if you just fix a point on the circle, and go 360 degrees around, well, if you fix a point on the circle and trivialize your g-bundle there, if you go 360 degrees around the circle, well, you get another trivialization of your g-bundle, which differs from your original trivialization by an element of g. So to a first approximation, a g-bundle on the circle is just specified by just giving an element of g. That's not quite right because it depended on the trivialization that you chose at a point what you really get is that G bundles on the circle up to isomorphism, well, these are the same thing as elements of G up to conjugation. The conjugacy classes of maps from the fundamental group of the circle into G. The fundamental group of the circle is just a free group on one generator. 
So a homomorphism is just an element of G. So this space should be familiar to you if you've studied the representation theory of finite groups. This is the, uh, the space of class functions on G. In other words, it's, uh, it's the vector space consisting of all functions from G to the complex numbers that are invariant under conjugation. And this space is interesting in the representation theory of, comp of, of finite groups because if you have a representation of a finite group, its character is a class function. And conversely, um, all class functions can be made as linear combinations of characters. So this space of class functions you could describe as representations of the ring of representation of ring of G tensored with the complex numbers. So I guess just what I want to say is in this example, um, this vector space is somehow related to represent the representation theory of G. Although I, I don't think I want to say any more along those lines. But, and similarly, in general, if you evaluate dyke graf witten theory on all kinds of different manifolds, well, you get things that you could describe explicitly in simple terms, uh, in terms of the original group G, but the axiomatics of topological quantum field theory are sort of a nice organizational principle for telling you what the totality of all these different invariants have to do with one another. And sometimes you can get information by, say, uh, taking some of the numbers that you, taking some of the numbers that this field theory is supposed to give you, and computing them in two different ways. So let me give you an example of that. So let's take this dyke witten theory and evaluate it on a torus. So what is this? This is some number. I want to compute this number in two different ways. So first, I want to compute it from the first definition that I gave you. So what is this number? This is the number of homomorphisms from pi 1. So let me call this t for torus. Pi 1 of t into g divided by the number of elements in g. So the fundamental group of a torus is just z plus z. So to give a homomorphism, you give two elements of G, and the only constraint on them is that they have to commute. So this is the number of pairs of commuting elements of G divided by the order of G. That's one calculation. Another calculation we could do, well, we did it earlier. If you have a two-dimensional topological quantum field theory, it's determined by a commutative Frobenius algebra. And what you assign to a torus is just the dimension of that Frobenius algebra. So it's the dimension of this space on this board. The dimension of this space is the number of conjugacy classes in G. So these two numbers are the same. So of course, you don't need to define dyke graf witten theory t to see that. But it's also, you know, you might have to think about this for, for a little bit. So as another exercise, prove that directly that these two numbers are the same. All right, so what I've been talking about so far, I said is what, what you might call, um, oh, I have four minutes left. Let me skip the twisted version of dyke graf witten theory. Let me just stick with the untwisted version. So this is an example of a topological quantum field theory. It's one which is reasonably easy to construct. Um, and what I'd like to talk about later in this week is generalizations of it. So there's a couple of parameters that I'd like to, verify, to, to vary when I consider generalizations. So what are some of the parameters that were involved in this definition? So let's, let me indicate parameters we might play with. So, well, first, one parameter is the dimension. 
here, this is, I said you could make a topological quantum field theory of any dimension given by this construction. Um, now, if I was doing the twisted version of dicraft witten theory, I would need an additional datum to get started, namely the parameter which controls the twisting, which is a certain, an element in a certain cohomology group of G. And that cohomology group should live in the same dimension as the manifolds that, uh, that I want to uh, get numbers out of. But you can, twisted or untwisted, you can consider these kinds of things in any dimension you like. So another parameter, I told you this all depends on a choice of a finite group G. And well, we didn't really use G in any of these constructions. What we really used was the theory of G bundles. Or equivalently, we used the classifying space BG. So the classifying space BG is a nice space, but what it, could we replace this by some other spaces? So what would that mean? Well, instead of trying to count G bundles on a manifold M, we could try and count maps from M into some other space X. Well, for that to be sensible, we probably want to know that there are only going to be finitely many maps from M into that other space X, up to homotopy. So we don't want to consider arbitrary, replace BG by an arbitrary space, but a space which is in some sense looks pretty finite. So the kind of spaces that I'm going to want to consider are spaces that have finitely many components, finitely many homotopy groups, and all of the homotopy groups are finite. So in these contexts, there, there's again an idea of what it means to, to say, uh, count the number of maps with mass. But the real thing that I want to vary later on in this lecture series is I want to replace the complex numbers by some other ring. So I told you a topological quantum field theory. Well, to manifolds of top dimension, it assigns a complex number. To manifolds of dimension n minus 1, it assigns a complex vector space. And of course, for purposes of the definition, there's nothing special about the complex numbers. We could replace this by, by any field or any ring. Um, but for purposes of the example that I gave you, the complex numbers was special. So what was special about it is that it had characteristic 0. And you can see that that is relevant. Well, uh, my original formula is erased. But if you remember the original formula for the number that you assign to an n-manifold, it was something divided by the order of g. And of course, that makes sense if you're working over the complex numbers. And it makes sense of, over a field of characteristic p unless p divides the order of the group g. So what if you wanted to replace, well, let me just try and sell, <coughs> sell you some motivation for considering a generalization like this. So I've defined for you dicraft witten theory, and I defined it for you first. It's a topological quantum field theory, so it produces manifold invariants. So that's emphasizing the point of view, all right, give me a finite group, I'll supply invariants for manifolds. But there's another way to think about it, which is, all right, give me a manifold. I'll supply for you an invariant of finite groups. And that is maybe a little more compelling looking at this example here. Like if your manifold is the circle, what I'm saying is, well, an interesting thing to consider is if you take a finite group, you can look at class functions on the group. That's interesting, say, because it comes up in representation theory. So from that point of view, dicraft witten theory, maybe you want to interpret it as a tool for studying finite groups or maybe other spaces x. Um, and if you have such a tool, well, a finite group it's, has some order, which is a finite number. And there are primes which divide the order of g, and there are primes which don't divide the order of g. And the primes which don't divide the order of g, those are the easy primes. The primes that do divide the order of g, that's where things get tough, and that's where the information is. So if you really wanted a, to think about this as a, a, an invariant of g, and you want that invariant to tell you useful things about g, it would be great 
if, for example, you, you, didn't, you weren't forced to invert the order of G in order to make these definitions. On the other hand, the definition that I gave you, the first thing I said was divide by the order of G. So let me just tell you the, the goal of this week is to give a similar definition or set up a theory which enables a similar definition, let me say, in a context where you're not allowed to divide by the order of G. So that's a pretty vague description of what's going to go on later this week. So let me just say, um, I'm going to give four lectures in this series. and. The first three are completely independent of one another. So in particular, nothing about topological quantum field theories or dicraft witten theory is going to appear in any of the later lectures except uh, for a few words of motivation. So in the next lecture, I'm going to, well, I'm going to set up, well, why don't I stop here? So <laughs> if you want to find out what happens next, come back tomorrow. <laughs>
not off the top of my head, but I think there's, I mean, th there isn't much to say about these things in, in two dimensions. They're all controlled by commutative Frobenius algebras, and they're all, there's more to say if you want to talk about extended topological quantum field theory. That sort of constrains what you're talking about more, and uh, also, well, why don't I just leave it at that? Yeah? Uh, just a definitional question. Um, when uh, we were defining uh, topological quantum field theory, did we want um, oriented uh, cordisms? So today I was, I was saying oriented. For, for, every, for what I said, ori everything should be oriented, or really, for the twisted version, you need an orientation because you need to take the fundamental class of M. If you were doing the untwisted version, it doesn't depend on orientations of anything. Um, the, in general, you, you could define the notion of topological quantum field theory for, you could define an oriented version, an unoriented version, a spin version. For whatever your favorite kind of manifold is, there's a, an analogous definition where you put in manifolds of, of that kind. Well, that's part of the data of a cobordism. Oh, sorry. The question is, if, if you're talking about unoriented manifolds, how do you decide if a cobordism is going from M to N or N to M? And the answer is, well, a cobordism, by definition, is a manifold with boundary together with a decomposition of the boundary into two pieces. One piece you declare to be incoming and one piece to be outgoing. So it's, it's just part of what you mean when you say you have a cobordism. It's so, sorry. On, Oh, were, were you going to answer the question, or you were going to ask a question? Oh, maybe. Okay, sorry. Okay, so we're, when we're working in the oriented case, uh, do we want the outgoing thing to have like reverse orientation? Yes, yes. Or so, I guess a corrected version of what I said is in the oriented case, a bordism from M to N is a manifold with boundary whose boundary as an oriented manifold is M union N op. Okay. Yeah. So the denominators occurred in a bunch of formulas in your talk. Yes. But I don't recall any moment where you uh, motivated why you introduced these denominators. You just like, put them there and you said it's a good idea to put them there. All right. Okay, please repeat the question. I will. So Andre asked, what's the point of all the denominators that appeared there? And let me add, I tried to sell you the rest of these lectures as I'm going to do something analogous in a situation where I'm, I'm going to wrestle with the fact that in characteristic P, I'm not allowed to put these denominators there. Why would that be interesting? What's the point of the denominators, et cetera, et cetera? So let me try and address that. So, so let's say. So here's the general thing that we're, uh, we're wrestling with here. We're trying to count something, like the number of G bundles. And what we're given is, you could think we're given a groupoid of G bundles. Let me say we're given a space of G bundles. We're looking at the, map, the space of maps from a manifold into BG. Connected components of this space are isomorphism classes of G bundles. And what we want to count is, Roughly the number we want to us we want to define what we mean by this. So there's a couple of candidates. So one thing you might, if you have a space with finitely many connected components, one number that you could assign to it is the number of connected components. That's not the number that I was considering. I was counting the connected components with mass. So what's better about that second way of counting? Well, so. Let me, let me propose two definitions of what it means to count the number of elements in a space where that space is, is infinite. So definition one, let's say the number of elements in x is the size of pi 0 of x, the number of connected components. And definition two, well, is the one that I was using in this lecture, the number of components number of elements of x, let me put this in quotation marks because 
what's being defined. Um, this is going to be a sum over all connected components of x of 1 divided by uh, pi 1 of that connected component. So what's better about definition 2 than definition 1? Well, here's something. So what if you have a space x and you have a covering space of x with finite fibers? So the fibers have cardinality n. So now what would you expect the relationship between the number of elements of x and the number of elements of x tilde to be? Well, if each fiber has size n, you might hope that the number of whatever the number of elements of x tilde is, it should be the number of elements of x times n. And that would be correct for either way of counting. If x was a finite set, then x tilde is also a finite set. And the number of elements of x tilde is just n times as big as the number of elements of x. But defi that definition 1 might not have that property. So what would be an example? Um, an example might be, like, let's say x is real projective space, Rp2, and x tilde is its universal cover, which is S2. Well, these aren't, these aren't the kind of spaces on which my, I wanted to define these invariants. Well, x, let me write x is Bg and x tilde is Eg, where G is a finite group. So this means the universal cover of Bg. So x tilde is a contractible space. So whatever we mean by counting the number of points in a space, we want this to be a homotopy invariant notion. So the number of elements of x tilde, this should definitely be 1. And now if this hope is correct, that means that since there's a map from x tilde to x, and it's a covering map whose uh, fibers look like G. That tells you that the number of elements of x you want to assign to it size 1 over the order of G. So that when you multiply by the size of the fibers, you can get the number 1. So this prescription, this is more or less uniquely determined Let's say, suppose that x, the kind of space x that I want to plug in in this lecture, is a space that has finitely many connected components, each one of which is the classifying space of a finite group. And for such spaces, there's a unique way of defining this invariant so, th so that, say, it's additive under disjoint unions, it's multiplicative for covering spaces in this sense, and, say, a contractible space has uh, has invariant 1. And that is this definition 2. Definition 1 will fail this test. Any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker again.